Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for a nice invitation and an, an invitation for this wonderful meeting. Today, I'll talk about the cardiac cirrhosis and heart failure. Actually, when I'm preparing my talk, I have a little curiosity why, I, uh, why the committee uh, choose this topic. So after listening to the third case of Professor Kim, I can understand the situation. So today, I will mention about the optimal transplantation candidate in patients with heart failure with the cardiac cirrhosis. So this review paper was almost published in almost 10 years ago regarding the cardiac hepatic interaction in heart failure. This review paper suggests two types of mechanism of cardiogenic liver injury. The first thing is the acute events such as myocardial infarction or cardiogenic shock can induce some hypoxic injury in the liver, so it can increase the cardiac liver, cardiogenic liver injury. The other types of mechanism is related to the chronic heart failure status. Heart failure status can result in the chronic passive congestion, and it can cause the evidence of a cholestasis. It can, so let me move the, the two mechanisms in detail. The first one, the uh, acute decrease in blood inflow to liver cause the acute severe liver hypoxia. So it can cause acute cardiogenic liver injury. The second mechanism is a chronic decrease in blood flow to the liver. It can result in the chronic liver hypoxia, and it can also decrease the chronic decrease in blood outflow from liver, so it can cause the chronic liver congestion. So we can, call, so we can find the congestive hepatopathy in this kind of heart failure patient. So the old review paper reviewed about the prognostic role of liver function abnormalities such as albumin or alkaloin phosphatase, AST, ALT, or gamma GT, and total bilirubin. So elevated this kind of liver function abnormality was related to the poor clinical outcome in heart failure patient. This is a really a little bit old concept. So they concluded that the impact of heart failure on hepatic function has been studied for many decades, but there is limited contemporary knowledge on the exact mechanism. This conclusion was uh, published in 2013. Following this paper, there's another review paper regarding the cardiac hepatic interaction, implication for management in advanced heart failure. They also described the prevalence of liver function test abnormality. So they found that about 20 or 30 percent of heart failure patients have a liver function abnormality, such as albumin or alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin, such like, and so on. So you know, this kind of some uh, post hoc analysis from the multicenter RCT data definitely showed the showed that the uh, uh, prevalence of left a liver function abnormality in heart failure patient. So this graph shows the laboratory parameter trend after the cardiogenic liver injury. As you can see, the AST and LDH level was peaked about just one day after cardiac injury, but these two parameters are rapidly decreased. So usually normalized about five days after, but ALT or INR level was picked in one day, but this this kind of uh, the ALT level was normalized about the 10 day, and INR level was normalized after two weeks, and total bilirubin level was usually picked at five days, and it can usually normalize after two weeks. So this kind of discrepancy of trend after cardiac injury, we can consider this kind of the, some discrepancies of the liver function abnormality. So in patient with the post-pontan, the HCC or HA guideline currently recommended that to monitor this kind of thing. So in basic concept, we have to monitor platelet count or gamma GT or INR and something like that. And in depth screening, we can monitor the alpha pitot brain or some imaging study. So combining this kind of parameter, uh, we can use the MERD score, including INR level and bilirubin level and creatinine level. So this is uh, an old paper from the uh, 
Columbia Group, they show that hepatic dysfunction and survival after heart transplantation. And then they found that in, uh, in pre-period of heart transplantation, there is uh, some portion, about 10% of a high MERD score group. But after one year, they could not find any high MERD score group. It means that after heart transplantation, MERD score usually continuously decrease. And there is another type of a scoring system called as modified MERD score. It excludes the INR level, then it adds albumin level. So we can calculate the modified MERD score like this. And they can also test the prognostic importance of modified MERD score. They found that the p-value was relatively lower compared to the uh, standard MERD score. So we can use the modified MERD score too. Another scoring system is MERD XI. XI. MERD XI uh, excludes the INR level, considering you know, uh, usually airbud patients use the warfarin, so we cannot use the INR level in this kind of patient. So MERD XI score uh, can be calculated like this using creatinine or total bilirubin level. And they also published a similar paper regarding the liver function as a predictor of clinical outcome in advanced heart failure requiring BAD system. They also compared the on BAD survival between the low MELD XI score and the high MELD XI score. So they found that high MELD XI group was related to the lower survival on BAD system. This kind of concept can be applied to the acute heart failure patient. So this paper published uh, by the Ponikoski group from Forend, they analyzed the multi-organ dysfunction injury on admission and identified acute heart failure patient at high risk for poor outcome. They define the organ dysfunction using three parameters. First one is myocardial injury using troponin I level. The second part is renal dysfunction using estimated GFR. And third function is regarding the liver, liver injury and at least one of the following using AST, ALT, or bilirubin, or albumin. So they can define organ dysfunction. As you can see, this is the baseline characteristic. There is no significant difference. The, uh, uh, baseline characteristics such as age, male, or ejection fraction among the one, two, three organ dysfunction injury group. And they found that in patients with three organ dysfunction group, there is a high prevalence of a CKD, and antipro BNP was relatively higher, but the sodium level or potassium or hemoglobin level was not significantly different among this group. A lactate level was not also significantly different. But they found that in one, uh, one year mortality, they can find the uh, uh, additively increasing trend of patients with uh, one or two, three organ dysfunction had a, a lower survival curve. And after adjusting the other confounding factor, they also found that the number of dysfunction or organs are usually related to the higher mortality in patients with acute heart failure. So they concluded that in patients with acute heart failure, dysfunction of one and organ dysfunction identifies patients at high risk for poor outcome. This kind of concept come from the, by the Japanese group recently. They use another index such as FIB4 index. They use the uh, component of a platelet count like this. And they found that there are some additive law of FIB4 score or uh, additive to the MELD XI score. So high MELD XI and high FIB4 score group had lower, lowest uh, survival curve. And, and then found that the cystatics was significantly higher after combining MERD XI with the FIB4. So maybe we can use FIB4 score too. So this kind of concept uh, can be summarized like this. Renal dysfunction and hepatic dysfunction have some additive, some synergistic role, uh, role in aggravation in acutely compensated heart failure. This kind of state is usually uh, prescribed as a low perfusion state and it can result in the congestion status. 
Let me move to the topic of advanced heart failure for preparing heart transplantation. This review paper suggested that advanced heart failure patients with high-risk features such as right heart failure or restrictive cardiomyopathy or abnormal liver function test or assigned by clinical exam and moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation in echocardiography or abnormal uh, abdominal liver imaging or heavy alcohol use, we have to consider the transjugular liver biopsy or measuring to portal pressure. Hepatic venous pressure gradient is like a concept like a wedge pressure, so we can calculate the HVPG gradient uh, as the wedge hepatic venous pressure minus the free hepatic venous pressure. This is a diagram of the hepatic vein pressure gradient. When you catheterization, we, you, uh, we can measure the wedge pressure and then write atrium and then go down to the inter IVC. We can measure IVCP and the free hepatic vein pressure. Then, uh, then wedging in the liver like this figure, we can measure the wedge hepatic vein pressure. Then we can calculate the hepatic vein pressure gradient. This patient just have the core pulmonary, so the hepatic pressure gradient was very low. But you know, this patient have a severe triscope tricuspid regurgitation with the underlying hepatitis C. So in, for this patient, we, uh, they measured the free hepatic vein pressure was elevated and the wedge hepatic brain pressure also was elevated and hepatic vein pressure gradient was elevated about 7.5. This means that cardiac cirrhosis. So they suggest that measuring the portal pressure and then if the patient had a hepatic vein pressure between 105 or the liver biopsy shows their score 0 or 1, this patient had a low hepatic risk for ALBAT and heart transplantation. But the patient had over 6 millimercury hepatic vein pressure gradient or liver biopsy shows some score over 3, this patient had higher hepatic risk for ALBAT or heart transplantation. The, in, in the gray zone, such as the patient with hepatic bank pressure gradient 105, but the liver biopsy shows that the score was 2A2B, we can consider for calculating MELD or MELD XI score. If the patient had a higher MELD XI score over 17, we can consider this patient have a higher hepatic risk for ALBAT or heart transplantation. Another good method usually uh, recently uh, suggested is uh, ultrasonogram liver elastography or fibro scan. This is a review paper from the gastroenterology. They have uh, limited data, but limited data, but uh, they they suggest some cutoff value of uh, liver stiffness, such as about 10 or 7 or. But interestingly, in this acute heart failure patient, the admission level of liver stiffness is over uh, 13, but at the discharge, this liver stiffness cutoff can be decreased about. Five. So we need more data to find some cutoff value for uh, <clears throat> for risk stratifying for the cardiac cirrhosis in heart failure patient. Another recent paper regarding the non-invasive diagnostic imaging test underdiagnosed cardiac cirrhosis in patients undergoing advanced heart failure therapy. They have they ignored all patients. They ignored patient with a liver biopsy and they divided it into two groups with the absence of cirrhosis or biopsy-proven cirrhosis. In biopsy-proven cirrhosis group, there is a higher prevalence of restrictive cardiomyopathy, but interestingly, there is no significant difference in other kind of laboratory parameter, including the parameter is included in the MELD XI score. In the result, ultrasonography has the best combined sensitivity specificity, but more than one third of patients with cirrhosis will go under undiagnosed by conventional imaging techniques such as abdominal sonar or abdomen CT. So they suggest that liver biopsy is associated with low rate complication. We can consider the liver biopsy for high risk of cirrhosis or with evidence of a portal hypertension. 
So they suggest that first measure some ribbon function tests and then non-invasive imaging tests such as abdominal ultrasonal or abdominal CT scan. And they can uh, find some evidence of liver cirrhosis or portal hypertension. And then if the patient has some risk stratification, especially for high-risk etiology such as congenital or restrictive, we can consider liver biopsy. This is the last one, the most, most important disease related to cardiohepatic syndrome is a fontan associated liver disease. Fontan associated of uh, post fontan period, that we uh, can have some elevated carbon pressure or non prosterity, so it can result in hepatic fibrosis in this post fontan fashion. So, if the patient has some high risk characteristic for chronic liver disease, we have to monitor the status of liver cardiac cirrhosis status. So in this case, we can consider only heart transplantation or we can consider combined heart and liver transplantation. After heart transplantation alone, in some cases, the FALD can, be, can progress to the cirrhosis and it can develop over hepatocellular carcinoma. So in this case, we can consider combined heart liver transplantation. This is the last, last uh, report. The recently published in JHLT, they suggest that there is no significant difference in survival in heart transplantation or combined heart lung transplantation. And the combined heart lung, heart lung transplantation Transplantation patient had a comparable survival with the patient with heart transplantation with no cirrhosis. And interestingly, the rejection rate was relatively lower in combined heart lung transplantation. It's suggesting that you know, the, some immunological hypothesis, liver protect the heart by immunology. So, okay, I think I put this right. So this is my last slide. When you consider your patient with heart transplantation, we have to evaluate clinical history or exclusion of other liver disease, and we have to monitor or imaging for the abdominal ultrasound or CT or MR, or, and we have to get the upper endoscopy for excluding the existence of a barracks or liver fiber scan. And then we can consider the hepatic vein pressure gradient. And rega in regarding the hepatic vein, hepatic vein pressure gradient, we can uh, use further analysis using such as uh, liver biopsy. Thank you for your attention.